Hello and welcome everybody to our Cultivating Living Soils webinar series. This is webinar number two, Story of Regeneration, Mixed Species Orchard. And as we, before we get started, just, just let everybody kind of get into the room here. Uh, what I typically like to ask is if you can in the chat button, which is gonna be at the very bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, just type in where you're coming from. We'd like to kind of see where in the world are our participants uh, showing up from. All right, we've already got to Idaho and Winnipeg. So Canada and U.S. are representing, and now the slew comes in. <laughs> <laughs> Worldwide has already been reached. <laughs> Scotland. Yeah. I saw Tasmania in there. Yeah, real Did quick. Zambia. Yeah. It's yeah. so fast you can't oh my gosh, yes. get it to your brain. No doubt. Yeah. I, I definitely think we've got the international audience represented today all over the world, which is really exciting to see. All right. Well, we've got a lot to cover in today's webinar, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, talk about uh, what we're going to cover in today's webinar. Um, we're going to go through some introductions and uh, get to know our panelists a little bit. And then we're going to have a presentation from Little Dog Farm's Regenerative Story. It's going to be about roughly around 45 minutes. Uh, Joe Tobias and Kathy and Ian Finley are going to give us a presentation about their story. And then we're going to have a quick video about Level Up Your Soil Package. And at the end, we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. And we really want to be able to have a good interactive series. And so I'll discuss in a minute about how to get access to the Q&A section. So again, total time for today's webinar is about 1.5 hours. All right, so just some um, rules of engagement here or, or kind of guidelines. Uh, first, everybody will be unmuted uh, for the duration of the webinar, just to make sure we've got really good audio quality, uh, just besides the panelists themselves. And then if you do have questions, especially again, we have 30 minutes for Q&A, and there are some really good stuff covered in today's presentation, so I'm sure there's going to be some great questions. Uh, the same spot where you hit the chat button, down at the very bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a Q&A button. So make sure that if you have a question that you want panelists to be able to cover, go ahead and put it in the Q&A section, not in the chat section. The chat section is great for to have this dialogue happening amongst all of you as we're going through the presentation. It's usually very lively, uh, but just recognize if you put your question in the chat, it could get easily missed or not actually brought up into the Q&A session. So if you have a question for the panelists, again, make sure you choose the Q&A section. And other than that, please go ahead and enjoy our webinar today. All right, and let's talk about this Cultivating Living Soils webinar series. So we've already had uh, webinar one, which was with Dr. Vanda Shiva and Dr. Elaine Ingham, and really talking about the future of farming. So there is a replay available at webinar.soilfoodweb.com. Uh, today is our mixed orchard species from Little Dog Farms Regenerative Story. And then we have two more really exciting webinars coming up um, on 11 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, February 15th. It's going to be a webinar on symbiotic impact of agroecology and the soil food web. And then on 11 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesday, February 28th, we're gonna have Cultivating Living Soils, Why Soil Matters and How, for, how to Further Your Education in Soil Regeneration. So two more great webinars uh, coming up. And again, uh, these will all be available for replay. So if you missed one of them or had to leave this webinar early, uh, you can always go back and replay the webinar. <clears throat> All right, let's do some introductions here. So Elaine, we'll hand this over to you. Okay, I'm supposed to kind of put together a, a who I am and where I've been in my life. <laughs> sure, in 30 seconds, right? <laughs> yeah, right, it's, it's kind of laughable. Um, exactly. <laughs> the last time we all sat down and, and all, what were all the different countries and all the different places, we have somebody operating, working with the population. And we basically cover everything except for one um, one major continent. I bet you can't figure out which one that might be. Probably very cold, right? Have very cold. I think uh, <laughs> water is hard to obtain. So been working very hard my whole life, really, to um, get more and more people understanding what's going on and getting more and more people to get away from the toxic chemicals that we were told were the way to garden, the way to um, agriculture um, from the green revolution on up. Uh, it was really a, a trick to get us all uh, sort of on drugs when it came to doing our um, doing planting and growth of uh, the plants, our gardens and our agricultural fields. And so I'm just so happy that we're seeing a, a good turnaround 
uh, we get we're getting more and more people at in, in institutions. Boy, that sounds fun at universities to start working with us. So it's coming along great, um, and I hope to hear uh, this story that um, Joe and Kathy and Ian are going to be talking about for us. Great, thanks, Lane. All right, Joe. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, thanks for having me here today. My name is Joe Tobias. I am a regenerative soils and living compost specialist based in Vancouver, British Columbia. I own a BC-based company called Root Shoot Soils, and I work primarily with land stewards, such as farmers like Kathy and Ian. Great. Thanks, Joe. Kathy and Ian. Hi, Kathy and Ian. Um, we are of British origin, moved to Canada in 2009. Uh, accidentally fell into farming a little bit. Um, we were farming down in the Lower Mainland near Vancouver area and we moved out to the Creston Valley in 2020. Had a sort of complete change of direction and model. Um, somewhere along that journey we met Joe Tobias and so as we were starting up this new ent um, enterprise we wanted to make sure that we did so on a really strong footing and so Joe has guided us through that. Great. I can't wait to hear you guys' story. And then I'm Brian Bank. I'm your host uh, for today's webinar. I'm a soil food web consultant. Uh, I currently have two businesses that I work with. Uh, Sprouted Soil is a company my wife and I founded. And then Soil Matters, which is a company that my wife and I have now partnered with Keisha and Casey Ernst from uh, Callus Bio Amendments. Uh, again, doing more consulting type of work. And we're based out of Oregon, USA. All right. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Joe, I'm going to hand this over to you. You're now in charge of the slides. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So we already did a bit of an introduction, but I want to go a little bit further. Um, Kathy and Ian, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourselves? Sure. <laughs> So, yeah, as we mentioned, we had been previously farming down just outside Vancouver. Um, we, call, we were calling ourselves accidental farmers at the time because we didn't really mean to be. We had moved here and I think we'd become a bit disenchanted with the food industry generally. And we only really got to that because you live in a new country and you go to the grocery store and the brands that you're used to buying aren't there anymore. So you start reading labels again and realizing that everybody everything's got corn syrup in it so we um we decided we just wanted to buy a little parcel become self-sustainable um and we did that in 2013 um we started taking some excess vegetables and eggs to our old neighbors in um, the urban sprawl that we'd moved from and one day one of their neighbors said hey what's this fresh food delivery going on how can we get in on this so from that kind of accidental conversation, things spiraled out of control for us a little bit. And so by certainly by 2016, we were um, doing four farmers markets, um, 40 CSA boxes. We were supplying 11 restaurants. We had events on the farm every weekend, uh, raising livestock as well. So pork, beef, um, lamb, chicken. So, so much stuff I can't really remember. <laughs> Um, and then uh, we actually had a devastating fire and our house burnt down in 2016 and it just stalled our progress a little bit. Um, kind of recovered from that, came back, um, had a more streamlined model, realised we were doing too much, too little really, and uh, felt like we were just hitting our groove. Anyway, it's a long story, but we felt we we it was time for us to move on from that property. Uh, it was only five acres, we needed more room. And so we started looking around BC. Uh, it was right in the middle of COVID. So it was a great time to travel because there was no cars on the road. We were seeing more elk than we were seeing vehicles at that time. And um, again, just found this place by accident. We were driving through Creston and uh, stumbled upon this beautiful lot of land that had been um, farmed for hay and thought, you know what? We can do something with that. So here we are, hemorrhaging money again. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so a quick intro uh, for myself. Before soil, my background was computing science, and it was in 2010 when I began my transition 
from computing science towards permaculture and then eventually soil ecology. It was during that time in 2010 uh, when I saw firsthand the damaging practices of the Green Revolution still lingering in small farming communities. As many of you probably already know, the intention behind that movement was to basically use more hybridized crops, more chemicals. So even today, back home, agricultural fields have advertisements featuring the company name and the chemical products used by the farmers. So I don't place blame on the farmers. Rather, I think that they were misled by the positive promises of what these technologies can offer them. So they uh, gradually abandoned their cultivation methods in favor of the intensive use of chemicals. So here I am, I adapted in this new environment. Um, I made the decision to start my journey with the Soil Food Web back in 2016, and that's the time when I met Elaine, and I had this passion to train directly from her. So she taught me that the data here uh, collects or that the data that we collect here paints a story about existence. It paints a story about life and death and interconnectedness. So throughout this talk, I invite you to approach Ian and Kathy's path with curiosity and hopefully use that same curiosity when you're tending to the soil in your farm or your garden. Okay. So Kathy and Ian, do you want to quickly talk about your farming journey? I know Kathy already briefly spoke about it, but I want to know what prompted you to make that change from vegetables with livestock integration in your five acre plot to now having an orchard. Why didn't you just go with what you already know? I think the farm in Langley is uh, was relatively close to quite a large uh, population. So that, uh, that brings opportunities, um, farmers' markets, um, producing fruits and vegetables. Um, there's a lot more restaurants and generally a lot more people, um, which allows you to market your produce a little easier. And the location we're at right now is, um, I wouldn't say remote, but there's not a large population here. Uh, those opportunities um, aren't as abundant for sure. Um, we felt that um, a more perennial style farm would be better suited to the environment we have here. Um, we used to get a lot of uh, moisture down in Vancouver, like on the coast. Um, it's good for vegetable production uh, for sure. Um, you can pretty much grow year round in Vancouver. Um, that is not what we have in Creston. It's, uh, it gets quite cold here in the winter. Um, this year we were down to minus 30, minus 35 for a, for a couple of weeks for sure. Um, all year round growing um, a vegetable is, is is not possible here without mm. uh, big greenhouses and a lot of input. Um, but perennial uh, tree fruit crops do uh, remarkably well in this valley and have done for generations. Really. Yeah, it's a big yeah. agricultural area, lots of orchards. And yes, of course, we had to... Um, consider the demographics of our, our, our clientele and the geography and climate of this area. Um, there was a bit, little bit more than that. I mean, there's some crossover, I think, is in that our plan is to open a cidery here. Um, we will still grow vegetables. We will still raise animals as part of that model. We will do uh, food from here. And so I think what we learned from our first farm in Langley is that I really would struggle to envisage a good sustainable farming method with method without integrated animals into it um they just they helped us regenerate that soil in in Lorica farm that like you're seeing on the slide when we moved there the soil had been quarried 40 years ago never remediated and we were watching our neighbor trucking in soil from an unknown source um, and that she got a grant for it was a good scheme from the local yeah. township but it was just rubbish it was crap soil and we just didn't want to buy into that at all so um, through our naivety almost we discovered this we discovered using pigs we got a couple of pigs and we started rotating them on this three-tier system so we would have pigs in one field one field resting and one field with vegetable production and the pigs would kind of follow the veg sorry the vegetable production would follow the pigs because they would till they would fertilize as they would go they were breaking up the soil and it just kind of opened the door to us and opened our eyes into what um was how important possible. soil yeah. health in what was possible to do from a very kind of natural perspective, really. 
so yeah just translating that here a little bit as well um it's a much bigger lot so we've had joe's assistance we're a lot more involved but we've started bringing animals into the picture as well and vegetables will be part of our production as well just outletting in a different way we're outletting from the source rather than going to market we're trying to bring people here awesome thank you and can you give us a bit of a background on the history of the current farm, specifically how it was managed by the former owner? And just as a reference, I also labeled the two main sections of the farms or of the farm that we're currently actively working on. So we have the North Orchard and we have the South Orchard. So, um, yeah, Ian or Kathy, background? Yeah, so this uh, picture is actually uh, a Google image. Um, it is the year that we took possession of the farm out in Creston uh, in 2020. Um, you can see there's there's zero vegetation there at all. That is that's purely bare soil. If if you could even describe it as soil, um, when we first moved here, it more resembled concrete pavement. To be quite honest. Um, it's dry land farming here, typically. Uh, there's not a lot of irrigation. Um, a lot of hay is grown in this valley that is exported out of here uh, to various other parts of the province and uh, and overseas also. Um, typically, hay grown here is on a three-year cycle, so they will, they will grow and harvest. Every three years, they come in, um, they basically turn over the soil and start from scratch again, reseed and start again. So that's still going on in this valley. Um, obviously not on this property, but that that is the way things are farmed here. And you can kind of see in the later slides the sort of damage that that does to the structure of the soil over time. There wasn't really any sort of structure, was there? When when the rains come, we would just wash everything, wash off the property and down onto the road and wash away. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, so having a healthy orchard is your vision for a little dog farm. And can yeah. you quickly walk us through the different entities that constitute a healthy orchard from your perspective? Yeah, like I guess the first thing is is the soil itself and, and getting the soil back to a state where it, it's actually alive um, and, and not completely dead and devoid of all life, which is, which is how it was when we got here. Um, and this is uh, where Joe comes in. Um, I, I actually took the Soil Food Web uh, Foundation courses myself, um, but felt that the actual state of this property when we got here, I needed help also. Um, we reached out to Joe, and she's been uh, a massive help to us along the way um, as we try to, to repair this piece of land and actually get it to a point where it's producing again. Um, watershed. Um, so we are looking to try and uh, encourage aquatic diversity here also, um, as well as storing water. So we get uh, a fair bit of snowpack and rainfall uh, here in the winter and the spring season usually. Um, but the summer is very dry here. Like we can get um, three months where we get absolutely no rain at all. Um, which um, means we have to irrigate, which I guess we'll get to in a second. Um, so we're looking to store as much capacity as we can on the farm. So um, we actually got a grant this year from the BC government to allow us to put some uh, irrigation ponds in here so we can store some of that excess water that we get over the winter months um, to help us deal with the scarcity in the summer. Um, but we decided to do that in a way that maybe is a little different. So we've decided to do uh, living um, ponds rather than just a, a big open storage capacity. And the hope from that is that we encourage more of the local uh, diversity of uh, flora and fauna into the actual, into the farm itself. Um, we get frogs here and snakes here. Uh, and all sorts of other creatures. Um, we have uh, birds here um, th that we wouldn't have if the if that actual water source is on the property, because um, it does get very very dry here in the summer. Um, as far as equipment goes, um, yeah, lot, lots of equipment required to get us from where we were originally when we moved on to the farm, um, to where we are today. Um, I think we talk a little more about equipment specifically uh, later on, so we'll kind of leave that there. Uh, irrigation infrastructure. So we um, 
we work with a an irrigation designer um, out of Vancouver, actually. Um, we decided to go with a double irrigation system here. So we have a micro sprinkler system, which basically covers in between the orchard rows themselves. So we can actually plant cover crops between the rows, which are 10 feet apart. So we have cover on the soil at all times. And then we also have a drip uh, system, which is uh, focused at the base of the trees themselves. Um, so we can get the volume of uh, water that we need to each of the individual trees, uh, especially in the summer months when it's uh, so dry here. Uh, and our plan going forward, uh, hopefully, is to push our inoculants that we're using uh, through the irrigation system um, so we don't have to run uh, as much machinery in the actual orchard itself. Uh, Structures-wise, uh, as Cathy mentioned earlier, where our ultimate plan here is to uh, open a cidery um, with hard cider, and that is uh, the primary focus of the orchard itself is to grow apples for that business. Uh, we will grow other fruits and vegetables also. Uh, we'd like to have a, a small restaurant here uh, where we can we can showcase um, those fruits and vegetables. Uh, and we'd also like to do some training here, if at all possible. So in the farm in Langley, um, we used to get a lot of uh, foot traffic through that farm, uh, coming and looking at what we were doing, how we were producing food, the sort of quality of food that we were producing, uh, and how we were doing that. We got a lot of people through, including universities and colleges, bringing student groups out to actually look at the way we were farming because it was so different to what they, they were seeing in the surrounding farms. Um, so we'd like to try and get something like that going here. Um, we got a, we still got some work to do, I think, before we get to that point, but that kind of is our ultimate game. Uh, as, par, as far as planting goes, um, so the orchard itself is, is somewhat different to what you will typically see in BC. Uh, we've gone down the route of a, a planar cordon, which is a two-dimensional tree, um, a little like an espalier um, type of arrangement, um, but with uh, two horizontal cordons at the bottom and then five vertical fingers on each tree, um, which actually produce the fruit. Um, it's a system that's been tried um, quite extensively now in New Zealand um, with good results, but it's all geared around uh, light interception in the actual canopy of the uh, tree species that you're growing and making sure that the tree gets as much light to as much area of the tree as possible um, in order to increase that the yield that you're able to get from, from, the, uh, from the tree itself. Um, we don't have a typical orchard in in the way that, again, you would see in BC. Uh, there's a lot of monoculture orchards here. and uh, We have a multi-species orchard here. Um, we grow apples, pears, plums, uh, peaches, and nectarines. Um, and as you walk through the orchard, you'll never find two tree species planted next to one another that are the same. And the whole idea behind that is that um, disease is not easily spread from one tree to the next. Um, it, it would have to travel maybe two or three rows to find the same uh, species of tree and the, and the actual same variety also. So we have a lot of different variety, even in the, in the apples themselves. Um, biodiversity wise, uh, yeah, lots of cover crop uh, sown in that orchard already. Uh, a mix of grasses, clovers, uh, legumes, uh, wildflowers in there too. Um, and our ultimate plan is to uh, put chickens and ducks in the uh, orchard also um, to help us with pest control uh, mainly. But also they, they kind of scratch around and go fertilize, deal with bugs and, and things as they uh, go through the daily activities. And we're leaving a lot of wild areas, actually. There's, yeah. there's a lot of treed areas that we're leaving on the farm. And we're doing some active rewilding down at the bottom end of the farm to help yeah. with that biodiversity as well. Fantastic. So one of the first steps that Ian took to try and remediate the soil is to sow diverse cover crop seeds. Um, Ian, can you tell us a bit about how that played out or didn't play out for you back in 2020? Yeah, it, it didn't play out at all, Joe. We <laughs> took our money and we lit it on fire, basically. <laughs> uh, so we got here uh, June 1st. We moved here. Um, 
you, you kind of saw from the previous slide the, the state that the, the actual farm was in when we moved here. Uh, the ground was so hard, it was it was like concrete. Um, so we went in uh, with a, the equipment we had at the time, which was a small rotor tiller, uh, knocked the hard top off, um, planted cover crop seed in the hope that something might germinate. Anyway, it did not. Um, we had an extremely dry spring that year. The summer that followed, um, we had a, a real heat wave here. It was it was uncomfortably hot. Um, yeah, germination was next to zero, if not zero, pretty much. Right. Yeah. right. yeah. So my first conversation with Ian was uh, soil health is an issue. He dug trial holes and found virtually little to no soil life. Um, the cover seeds, as he mentioned, did not germinate. Poor organic matter levels on both fields, the north and the south orchard. So baseline values at the time was 2.2 and 3.8 percent, respectively. He also wants to produce compost and apply extracts and teas, which meant he needed to have the proper equipment to do those things. And he also wants to soil test or test the soil for the initial five years until the orchards are established and flourish. So my conversation with Ian really revolved mainly around restoring the microbiome. So in April, 2021, they invited me to their farm. These were the photos I took during that time. And you can see just by these photos that a lot of work needed to get it done uh, to get it to a living state. Um, because the soil had already been damaged quite intensively in the past, I suggested to do a couple more passes of disturbance using equipment to break up the compaction. So I call this restorative disturbance. Um, Ian, can you talk about the amount of effort that was required to break up these clods and the type of equipment that you used? How deep did you go? And Kathy, how you felt about disturbing the soil again? Yeah, so... Um... We embarked on uh, buying some heavy equipment, so uh, a, a tractor, 75 horsepower tractor, um, which to be fair, we don't need for our farm and operation really, but that's the size of the equipment we needed to actually break up the compaction in the soil. Um, so that tractor pulled a, a two prong ripper um, and the results you can see on your screen in front of you. Um, those tines are three feet long, um, they basically get pulled at a very slow speed through the, the soil structure itself um, to break up the compaction that, that we had here. Um, after that time, we uh, took a cultivator through to break up those clods and a disc to kind of break up some of the bigger stuff, not to get the structure back to dust, which is effectively what that crust was on the top when we got here. Um, but to get it to a point where it would actually take a seed that we could run a seeder over it. Um, yeah, it was. And what, while I could hear and understand the concept behind what we were doing, it just, it felt so wrong. It hurt my heart. <laughs> we, we were farming in a very sort of permaculture method down in Langley and, you know, talking about not disturbing the soil and, it, even the language that we use, you know, the words to describe these uh, implements like ripper just sounds so aggressive and that's how it felt. So it really, it took something for me to overcome and say, okay, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. All right. So one of the best tools to have on hand to accelerate restoration is by teaming with the microbes. Ian set out to build compost. This was his initial setup. Uh, we started with roughly four cubic yards of compost for 25 acres. That's not a lot. And the reason for choosing a small volume to begin with is so that Ian can get a sense of how to properly manage his compost piles and have a good understanding of the resources available to him locally. So Ian, do you wanna talk about the challenges in acquiring the resources in the beginning? Yeah, so we'd like to pull the resources from the farm as much as you can. Uh, when we got here, that wasn't an option for us. So we had to kind of go out into the local community and, and source our materials. So uh, luckily for us, there was a small micro brewery that had just popped up in town. Uh, they were just kind of getting going uh, and looking for an outlet to get rid of their uh, spent grain after the brewing process. So we said we'd take all their waste. Um, we found a local uh, organic chicken farmer 
um, who was uh, looking to get rid of his chicken manure. So we, we kind of teamed up with him too. Um, he and silage is, as I said previously, is a big thing here. So sourcing those materials was relatively easy. Uh, we were able to team up with a, a couple of local farmers here um, who are looking to get rid of silage bales that weren't any good for feeding now and that had spoiled in some way, shape or form. Um, and then we have a, a massive wood uh, industry here. There's two big mills in town. Um, so we um, we approached one of the mills to see if we could get um, wood chips that were of a, a size that we could use. Um, so we uh, we managed to get them to break the um, bark that they that they have at the mill down into uh, smaller pieces, so we could actually use it for our compost making. Awesome. So it sounds to me like you weren't just teaming with the microbes, but you were also teaming with community. Yeah, yeah, we're a big community here. Actually, I was just, as we were going down that list, realizing that these people are our friends now. So it was great for us to kind of integrate into the community now and meet with these farmers and stuff. But a lot of effort. Yeah. A lot of effort now for less later, hopefully. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, and can you tell us about your composting experience with this particular process? So you've built compost piles before at Lorica Farm. How yep. is this different than what you were doing before? Uh, previously at Lorica, we... Uh, we had a, a big bin, so we, we used to get a lot of volume of food waste at Lorica. That's how we used to feed our animals. So there was a big warehouse in, in Vancouver that used to uh, bring fresh produce from all over the globe and then and then distribute around BC. Um, and there was always a lot of spoilage there. So we used to pick up uh, multiple tons of food waste from there every uh, week and uh, primarily feed our pigs with that food waste. But anything... That was left over or excess that uh, we used to put into a, basically a bin that measured 20 feet square and was about five feet deep. Um, all that material went in the bin at whatever point it came to the farm and we couldn't use it. And then periodically, once a week, we'd go in there with mechanical means, a tractor, and, and turn it around to get air in there. Mm -hmm. Not the best composting process at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so when building high quality thermophilic compost piles, it's important to keep track of temperature and moisture. So this is actually one of Ian's compost logs from one of his piles. He would send screenshots of the logs and I would record them in my spreadsheet so I can have a better understanding of the behavior of his piles. Um, unfortunately, out of the four piles, we were only able to use two piles for the treatments, which meant we only had roughly two cubic yards for 25 acres. Um, Ian, did you worry about having only that little volume to work with at this point of the project? Two cubic yards of compost for 25 acres it does not seem a lot. Um, this is not something that you've done before. You've composted at higher volumes. How? What did you think about this at this point yeah, in the project. I, I, yeah, I thought we'd never make that work, Joe, to be quite honest. <laughs> like uh, there was just, yeah, two <laughs> yards and 25 acres. It, yeah, it doesn't go very far, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and as you notice, or some of you probably noticed that these piles are bacterial dominated. The fungal to bacterial ratio are below the minimum desired for fruit trees, but on purpose. So can we still use these piles for extracts and teas? I would say absolutely. Um, this is what Little Dog Farm had to fix on the left. The compost piles had an excellent population of predators, specifically protozoa and nematodes. Both of these groups have species that feed on bacteria. Their feeding keeps the bacterial communities active, which forces them to reproduce, to multiply, and build habitats to protect themselves. All of these actions encourage decomposition, resulting in the formation of new soil structures. So we wanted to take advantage of the microbes' ability to reassemble soil. This is our take on adding nothing, as Walter Yenny would say, which means really encouraging complex pore spaces. So Ian, do you want to talk about your equipment? How difficult was it to acquire equipment in Canada and the special sprayer you had to custom order and any other changes you'd like to make to your current setup? Yeah, so I think uh, a lot of the equipment, oh, I would say 95% of the equipment that's available is geared around uh, intensive agricultural farming practices. 
uh, and not around the type of farming that we're trying to promote here. Um, the spray rig um, that you see in the center photo there um, actually came from a US company out of New York State, uh, a company called Gregson Clark. They made that specifically for us on this farm uh, and specifically uh, for the equipment that we had, so the tractor that we purchased previously to do the ripping. Um, we still went back and forward with those guys with that spray rig to try and iron out some of the issues that we thought we would have in the future. So it's relatively hard to clean. Um, off the shelf spray rigs are relatively hard to clean. Uh, the tank itself normally has like a screw lid as does this one. Um, but getting in there to actually get that tanks like squeaky clean, um, which is what we need for for the microbes and, and, and the other bacteria that we're trying to spray. Like cleanliness is a big thing for us. Um, and typically chemical farming, it doesn't really matter if that tank gets cleaned out at the end of the working day properly or not, because you're putting toxic chemicals in it the next day anyway. Um, trying to get them to design the rig with the least amount of um, bends in the piping um, to get from the actual tank through the pump uh, and out onto the spray jets at the back um, was a challenge. And then just finding a, um, a diaphragm pump that could actually deal with the biology and give us the spray pattern that we needed um, was a challenge too. Uh, those guys stepped right up, to be fair to them, and, and we got this spray rig um, delivered within probably three months of ordering it. Um, but again, from the US, not, not available in Canada. Uh, on the left-hand side is our uh, brewing setup. Um, so we chose to uh, to elevate the brewer um, up off the ground on a tower. This makes it way easier for us to dispense the actual finished uh, teas and extracts from the, the brewer itself uh, into the tank. Um, so basically, I can slide that tractor right up to up to that uh, up to the brewer there and, and download straight into the top of the tank, and then away we go spraying. Um, the brewer we made some modifications to also um, at the bottom, the discharge was on a pump initially. Now it's on a two-inch line straight out of there and straight into the spray rig. Just saves us time when we're brewing, downloading from the from the brewer to the, to the sprayer to go out into the field. And this is just a sidebar, really, but we also needed equipment uh, that met our power needs. We we're 100% off-grid here, so we needed equipment that could be managed by solar. Um, we've run into some challenges with that, but seem to have overcome. And it's the same... We mentioned earlier about having the water, the grant to pump water up up this huge hill to, to our farm. That has to be all operated by solar as well. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it just brings different challenges for sure when you're thinking mm -hmm. about equipment and and its capacity. And uh, this is three treatments later. So these photos were taken exactly one year apart. This the the photo on the right was a surprise photo that Ian texted me, and I'm like, oh, awesome! This is wow. This is great. Um, how has this changed for you guys in a year? Was this something that you expected? Uh, I don't think so. Like given the challenges of the previous year, um, I was surprised at the amount of growth that we got with the minimal amount of input that we would actually put in. Like we didn't spray a lot that year, really. Um, we sprayed as much as we could with the material we had available and I was very concerned at the time that it wasn't enough. We weren't spraying enough and that we wouldn't really see any real benefit. And and then and then you look a year ahead and it's like it looks like a different place. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think we knew what to expect really. We had zero expectations almost. But and as Ian said, we didn't feel we were doing enough. But you know, there's some real life issues entering in there. We both work off farm, we both we have a family and I'm sure probably most of you on the, on this webinar can relate to that, that you can't just focus on on your farm 100 percent of the time or you're growing. So so it's great for us to be able to do what we do, live our lives and be able to see this um, change with minimal amount of input, really. Yeah. Who knew that two cubic yards for 25 acres can go a long way, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so this is the North Orchard. A few months later, at this point, no work had been done. As Ian mentioned, they did the treatments in the fall before that or before in the fall of 2021. Um, can you describe 
what it felt like walking that field. Yeah, well, as you can see, the, the vegetation's the height of me, and I'm six feet. So um, we kind of left it alone that year. We didn't touch it at all. We didn't take any equipment into that field at all that year. Um, we just let nature do its thing, um, and you can see the results. Um, we let all the species that wanted to grow in that field, we just let them go. Um, everything went to seed at the end of the year and reseeded itself for the following year. Um, we didn't interfere in that process at all. And we also saw a change in the wildlife that was here. So lots of small birds, like seeing that center photo, all the seed heads on there, like there was a multitude of small birds that we hadn't seen on this property since we got here, uh, feeding on the seed heads. And then also at ground level, so in the soil, um, we were starting to see signs of life down there. The odd earthworm, not many, but the odd one here and there. Um, and the vole population like just exploded. Like there's little tunnels everywhere in the soil. Uh, and then we started, uh, we did get a raptor through here that year too. So we have a, an owl that was using that field then for hunting, mm -hmm. which, which we'd never seen before too. Awesome. And then you saw the covers get really tall in the south orchard, but then you had to get the field ready for posts and irrigation, which meant that you had to disturb the soil again. Um, and knowing that that work had to extend to spring of 2023, what was going through your mind at this time that you had to, you, you see the growth um, and then you had to disturb again? Yeah, so um, a couple of things, I guess. So the ripping, um, which worked so well to break up that compaction uh, over time settles, like the soil settles back into the, that ripped area. So you end up with a field that is uh, nowhere near flat for running equipment at a later date. Um, we have to run heavy equipment in there to put our trellis system up. Um, I guess with hindsight, we could have done that previously. Um, but then that gives you uh, issues with getting larger equipment in if there's if there's a trellis or post system in place at the time. So we took the decision uh, to do all that heavy um, ripping earlier without the infrastructure in place and then put that in later. No one find well that we were going to set ourselves back a little bit um, as far as the soil went, but we felt that we could we could bounce back from that once we got the, the trees in and were able to, to get the cultivation going and the water going, the irrigation in there. We had moisture during the summer months then. Um, and you'll see later how much growth is in that orchard now. Okay, so fast forward to summer of last year. We know there's been soil disturbance due to the new infrastructure. Ian had put in irrigation lines and posts for his planting system. We have been monitoring nematode populations to identify the effects of our implementation. So on the bottom left-hand side of this chart, it shows the minimum desired for deciduous trees. If you just go along that first row, um, our initial analysis happened back in April 2021. That's the yellow box where it says initial. Three treatments were completed between initial and April 2022. So there's an arrow there that says three treatments. And another analysis was performed in April of 2022. And there's a visible jump in the beneficial nematode population from the treatments and also from sufficient moisture. Disturbance happened again at some point between April 2022 and May 2023. So that's over a year apart. And it was during this time when Ian had to put in the new infrastructure. So we're making a few speculations here, but you can see the significant decrease in the total beneficial nematodes on the very right-hand side from the time that they treated the field to the time that they had to disturb the soil again to put in the new infrastructure. We also had a very dry July last year. Many farmers were told to restrict their water use, which did not help the nematode population. So nematodes are effective soil health bioindicators. Performing analysis on them helps with understanding soil structure. Their diversity and biomass can tell us how well our management practices are affecting soil quality. So similar to plants, they we have pioneer plant species. Uh, nematodes have short lives or some 
groups of nematodes have short lives, they have repro high reproduction rates, and they know how to take advantage of degraded soils, and they're good colonizers. And then there are equilibrium plant species. They will persist and remain unchanged as long as the environment is undisturbed. So we have those same groups in the nematode community as well. So in the case of nematodes, understanding their community structure in different seasons or while determining whether a specific soil practice is effective can tell us if we're moving in the right direction as far as improving the soil structure goes. So basically with them, the question that we are trying to answer is, are we building complex pore spaces? So Ian had to restore the South Orchard after the new infrastructure had been put in. He built more compost. He used the same recipe, but he had very different results from his previous piles. Ian, can you talk about your improvement in your composting process for this time? Yeah, so we changed our cages. Um, we uh, initially used like a fence and wire for the cage. Uh, we went to a, like an expanded uh, mesh um, cage, which are uh, four feet tall, uh, four feet wide, and they, they'll take two cubic yards of material. And our reason for doing that is we, um, we struggled to get the temperature up, I think, initially. Um, here in this in this environment that we were in so a bigger cage gives you uh or should give you a bigger core temperature at, at that actual temperature we need to do proper composting um and and the material that we were using um we were able to use uh, more material from the farm so you saw the growth in some of the in the fields there so we were actually harvesting that material from the farm so we weren't bringing as much material from off farm now and we were able to harvest or cut some of the, the, the grass in the in the fields there and actually bring that material um, to our composting. Um, so I think that helped us too. Um, you're just replicating the, the biology that's actually present on the farm then, right? For sure. Uh, so in July of last year, I revisited the farm to help Ian come up with a new plan to support the newly planted young trees in the South Orchard after disturbance. And... As part of the visit, we also made more compost. Um, this is Ian with his sprayer in the middle photo. And um, Ian, can you uh, tell us about whether or not you had to configure the sprayer to accommodate for your spray pattern now that the planted or now that the young trees have been planted? Yeah, so we had the foresight when we ordered the sprayer to make sure that we could uh, easily adjust the spray heads on the back of the actual spray rig itself. Uh, to spray vertically um, so it was relatively easy to adjust the the spray head at the back of the rig so instead of it spraying horizontally um, which we had been doing with the soil application we were able to turn those heads 90 degrees and actually spray vertically so when we drive uh, in between the orchard rows and uh, the plants are 10 feet apart we're able to get full coverage on the eight foot height of the trees on either side of the row that we're driving down and uh, as part of the visit, I had this idea of building a little fungal nursery for Ian to grow fungi, somewhat facilitated, which will eventually, hopefully, help with increasing fungal biomass in his fields. So this is in addition to making his thermophilic compost piles. The setup here on the very left-hand side photo, we have eight bales of straw, and we did a lasagna-type format of spreading moist wood chips, taking chunks of fungal spawn, placing them on the wood chips, and putting another layer of wood chips, and repeat the process. And finally, covering with construction paper at this point and then basically this is what it looked like um two roughly two weeks later uh we started to see mycelium on the wood chips roughly three months later king's Trefaria, which was the fungal spawn that we used um we started to see the fruiting bodies and then six months later straw bales were completely colonized by mycelium and spread to the surrounding soil um ian what are your plans with this nursery uh, so we're actually working with a, a, a mushroom producer who is in the next uh, next town from us, uh, looking to get nine different species of mushrooms. So we're going to make up the same size beds that we did with you, Joe, um, but with nine other species of mushrooms. So we're just waiting for some feedback from from him as to what he thinks will survive long term here, because our plan is to take that. Uh, material and actually put it into the orchard at some point and we want that uh, material to to keep growing 
Um, so we want to make sure that we get species that are um, able to grow and survive and actually thrive in, in the environment we have in the, in the uh, orchard now. Awesome. And uh, this is last year, uh, fall of 2023. Kathy and Ian, this is the South Orchard. Um, can you tell us about these photos? You woke up to this. How did you feel? It was a bit of a surprise, actually. We hadn't been out there for a, a few days, probably a week, and uh, went out into the orchard with the dogs, as you can see there, and uh, was just everywhere was dotted with white puffballs. Um, delicious, by the way. <laughs> um, but really reassuring that there was those, uh, the fungal spores were in the soil and the mycelium was moving around and just gave us hope, really. Um, nothing would have grown in that concrete soil that you saw at the beginning so to see it green you can see the different species of greenery we've got in there the, the the clover and so forth and then dotted with these great mushrooms was just uh just cemented that we were going in the right direction really <laughs> yeah and i think you had about five to six different types of mushrooms that popped up right yeah, we did. yeah, we did. yeah. 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 and uh you see the change from before may 2021 this is just over two years ago and then now um do you what do you feel about the orchard moving forward seeing those pictures actually makes makes me well up a bit because yeah. <laughs> we see it every day so we see the change very slowly so um yeah. yeah it just again reinforces that this is the right approach for us um it makes me a little bit sad that the people around us aren't seeing that yet i think they need to see our success i think it's gay brown that says there's nothing that will make farmers take notice of your methods until they see you driving a new truck in mm -hmm. so i think we just need to show people that this is working um you know our gates are always open we're looking at ways of bringing people when we have accommodation on the farm so we can certainly have people here and share that learning but for our own um business model i think this is this is just it's inspiring really <laughs> we're really happy that we've got this far this quickly yeah we there's certainly people in the valley who are asking questions already like they see they see what's going on here they see the amount of growth in the fields here and they're they're starting to wonder what's going on because they they know we're doing things differently here for sure and i think really to cement that there was a big um corporation who bought up some land here for wineries they already own a lot of wineries in the okanagan and word got to them about our orchard and they purposely sent people out to look at what we were doing and, and Ian ended up working for them quite a bit actually in advising on their compost tea and how to set up and and that kind of thing so yes it's starting to happen people are starting to talk about it which is really positive. Awesome. So I just want to close off this talk by quoting Dr. Vandana Shiva, who spoke at the first webinar. Um, when you were doing the right thing for the earth, she gives you great company. Uh, Kathy and Ian, finally, can you tell us about the different companies you've inadvertently invited onto your farm since cultivating living soils, uh, insects, birds, ground animals? I had no idea that BC had stick insects even. So. Yeah, we the, there's this there's so much here that wasn't here before. Like mm. it was so, it silent. was so silent. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was silent and and barren. There was nothing here. We have so many different bird species here, like mountain bluebirds that are quite a rare species. They're here now. They they were in the orchard uh, this year. Uh, a multitude of small birds, finches. There's crows and magpies here that weren't here before. Like we have a breeding pair of woodpeckers here. Um, who actually do a remarkably good job of stripping dead trees for us um, and dropping all the bark at the bottom, which we can then just scoop up and use in our compost. Uh, yeah, we have Western a, Screech Owl. Yeah, we have a Western Screech Owl family here now. Um, the voles in the in the fields are like people might think that's a bad thing, but they're they're tunneling, making holes in the in the soil and in the like deep down too, they go a long way down. And if they're there, then there's there's a food source for them too. So they're they're eating they're eating worms and, and whatever else might be in the soil now too. So it's a good sign that they're there too. Um yeah. And then there's there is frogs and snakes and things coming, but we think that will increase as we bring the ponds yeah. ponds online as well. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh thank you, Kathy and Ian. That's it for our, our presentation. Over to you, Brian. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
Joe, Kathy, Ian, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. And I tell you what, there's a lot of dialogue going on in the chat, a lot of questions. Uh, really, really impressive work. So, so thank you very much for sharing your story. Uh, so before we get to the Q&A part, uh, we do have a short video to show to everybody and talk about our promotion for uh, this month, and then we'll get right into the Q&A. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and start our video. Welcome to the Soil Food Web School, where our mission is to empower individuals and organizations worldwide to rejuvenate the health of their soils. Whether you're a farmer, a dedicated grower, or someone who cares about soil regeneration, we are here to provide you with the essential tools and inspiration. Our goal is to support you in regenerating soils within your farms, gardens, communities, and ecosystems. Join us on this journey as we equip you to elevate your ability to take practical action, no matter where you are on the planet. As we head into 2024, we continue to expand our course offerings and create opportunities for our learning community to support resilient ecosystems. Right now, we are proud to introduce the Soil Food Web Essentials course taught by a diverse group of Soil Food Web School educators. And from now until February 29th, this new course is bundled with our flagship foundation courses taught by Dr. Elaine Ingham and the Soil Sponge Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse at a 46% discount off the package value. Your plant's only getting two important things from above ground. The rest of the nutrients that your plant requires come from the soil. The soil is full of invisible workers that we cannot see with our eyes, but they play a fundamental role in our lives. The protozoa, the nematodes, the bacteria, even viruses can all come together in the root system of the plant, and the plant becomes the scaffolding of a community. We want to know what each one of these groups of organisms do for the plant and then what is the plant doing to try to select for the beneficial organisms here. Just like us humans have microbes in our guts that help with the decomposition of the food that we eat, the microbes in the soil make nutrients available for plant roots. Plants also use their roots to secrete sugars and feed all below ground organisms. A healthy soil has the full complement of soil biology and therefore can provide all the nutrients a plant is ever gonna need. Nutrient bioaccumulators are plants that have a superpower. They can suck in and store more nutrients than any other plant, making the soil richer and healthier. Every action and component is vital in sustaining this underground world. Venture into this transformative world of essential ecology, microbiology, and soil stewardship in the Soil Food Web Essentials course. Together with Dr. Elaine Ingham and a global team of soil educators, discover how you can partner with plants and microorganisms as they shape a more verdant world. Boost your biological partnerships for abundance and resilience on farms, gardens, and landscapes. This course is an accessible starting point for you to choose a path toward ecological restoration, permaculture, producing biologically complete soil amendments, practical microscopy, consulting with production professionals, and advocacy for a new way of living in harmony with our biosphere. Go deeper into the fundamentals of making, assessing, and applying biologically complete amendments and learn how to rapidly and effectively regenerate soils across farms, ranches, gardens, and landscapes in the foundation courses. Explore over 45 hours of lectures delivered by Dr. Elaine Ingham, covering the theory and application of the Soil Food Web approach. Get your questions answered by our science team through our student forum and monthly student-only webinars. Gain a fresh view of climate, soils, water, economics, and community care in the Soil Sponge Workshop. Learn why a healthy soil sponge is the fundamental infrastructure that makes life possible and how biological systems create both our climate and economies. In this three-part live discussion workshop with renowned author and speaker Dee Dee Pursehouse, join with people from around the world to gain understanding of how to address global challenges through land management. This workshop also provides a stepping stone to Dee Dee's new advanced courses due to be launched later in 2024. When you sign up today, you'll also get a coupon for $150 off the upcoming Permaculture Design Certificate course. 
featuring 70 plus teachers from 23 countries. This diverse group of permaculture professionals will help you design ecological and health management systems that work in harmony with nature. A thorough understanding of permaculture principles will allow you to implement thoughtful management practices and help you live in balance with the earth and your community. So to summarize what's included, you'll get the four-part foundation courses taught by Dr. Elaine Ingham, the Soil Food Web Essentials course, the Soil Sponge Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse, and a $150 coupon to apply to the Permaculture Design course. The Soil Food Web School offers a 100% money-back guarantee, so if you're not completely satisfied, you can get a full refund in the first 30 days so long as you've watched 32 lectures or less of the foundation courses. Financing options are now available, so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. Learn how you can level up your soils today. Thank you everybody for watching our video. And just to, to kind of uh, summarize here, we do have two offers that are happening right now. One is around the Level Up Your Soil package, which really the, the video was uh, really descriptive about. And then we have the new offering, which is around Soil Food Web Essentials. And really think of this as, as an introductory course into understanding the Soil Food Web and the Soil Food Web principles. And it really kind of opens your eyes to, to how this actually all works. And it's covered in much more detail when you get into the actual foundation courses. Okay, so let's go ahead and start talking about Q&A. And so we have a question here. And panelists, just to let you know, go ahead and uh, remove yourself off mute if you can or be you know able to, to unmute yourself quickly. Uh, the first question is from LN. And the question is, can well-broken-down cow manure serve as the exclusive component for a vegetable garden? I follow the no-dig approach of Charles Dowding. Therefore, I do not dig the soil to be more precise, but regularly adding 10 centimeters, about four inches, a well-decomposed cow manure each season result in a balanced soil for vegetable growth. What say you, panelists? We depend on a lot of, of, of um, other things going on, how well we can hit some particular goal. But I, as long as you've composted the material adequately, you've gotten the temperature above 131 degrees Fahrenheit for at least 72 hours, and you have to do that three times. It's the Pasteur work that come, is coming in there from um, human health production. Um, and then the length of time, you've got to keep the temperature above a, 131 um, for three days, or you can go, uh, you can uh, reduce that by 24 hours, and um, that's okay as well. So I, I can't get in the, into this too deep, or I'll spend the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> You know, one of the ways I look at it too is we have many tools available to us, you know, and broken down cow manure, sure, it's going to provide some amount of benefit to there. But boy, you could take that cow manure and really transform it if you start adding in some woody materials, high carbon materials, green materials, and actually go through a really good thermophilic composting, kind of like what Ian and Kathy had, had shown uh, that they did. And so you can make a higher quality kind of material off of that cow manure. Um, so yeah, I mean, broken down cow manure provides some benefit, but probably diversity of organisms in there are gonna be somewhat low. Uh, the benefit is gonna still be in the lower category or scale. Uh, why not transform it into some really, really good, you know, biologically complete compost? And if that's not your own manure or your own animal's manure, um, you wanna be really careful about what they are feeding the animals. And when you're going to pick it up, you've got to ask a lot of questions about uh, what they've been feeding, how they've been treating the animals, or you could be very surprised by um, uh, unpleasant problems occurring because of that. Sure. It, you know, as far as the other part of the question was around no dig, uh, you know, just placing compost or, you know, on top of the soil, is it acceptable? Sure. Why not? It's a, it ends up being kind of like a mulch layer. It will get incorporated. I'm sure you're going to get earthworms and other critters are just going to pull it down into the, to the soil profile. Um, and then again, biology is going to move down into that root zone of those plants. So top dressing is not a problem. We do it all the time. Um, Ian, Kathy, Joe, anything you want to add to this question? 
No, not really. Just to back up what you said, um, we in the old farm, we were finding some benefit from spreading uh, brew grain, spent brew grain on top of our asparagus bed in particular, and just leaving it to cake on. Um, obviously, you get all those kind of compost and mulch layer benefits, but it was also drying on there and suppressing the weeds as well a little bit. So, yeah, I, I agree. We could have used it better, but it was doing something. <laughs> exactly. Great. Joey, Joey. Yeah. Oh, I agree with everyone. I always offer diversity. Um, as far as top dressing goes, that is, I think it also depends on the soil's quality. In this case, we can't really, you know, if we're looking at Ian and Kathy's field um, and turning a section of that field into a vegetable garden, I think that top dressing might not work at that point. We need to really disturb the soil and really go down there to break up that compaction and then move forward with the remediation process. So it sure. really depends on the situation as well. Great the more yeah. div diverse we get it, though, we seem to be reducing that time where mm -hmm. you see a beneficial effect. So, you know, we, these are kind of early days in the science of what's going on in an agricultural field. And are you trying to grow trees? Or are you trying to grow shrubs? Or are you trying to grow, you know, carrots? And, and you just go back along the successional sequence and... They're very different things that you're going to do depending on what you're going to grow. What do you want to grow? Agreed. Okay, great. Thanks, panelists. All right, let's move to the next question. And this one's from Fabio. And the question is around for cover crops. What is a good successful approach if you have no tilling practices? We tried spreading, the, uh, spreading but the birds ate the seeds and we had a very low germination rate. Very common problem with cover cropping. Yep. yep. Uh, Pals, um, go ahead, Lane. I'd, I'd, uh, I would probably go out there immediately and um, be doing things in the field, scaring the um, the birds off. Or if you can't be present in that field um, and scaring the birds away, you would want to put another application of the compost on the surface and make it a hard place for the um, birds to come in and uh, find the seed. So yeah, uh, diluting it sort of and making it harder to find is the is the game you get to play. It, you know, and this becomes be kind of a, a contentious issue, but you know, like no tilling and then the use of seed drills. So mm -hmm. a seed drill is a very common tool that we use when we're doing cover cropping, which simply is, is a basket in the back of a tractor and you have these little tines that will cut little tiny furrows and they'll drop a seed into the furrow and then they'll close it back up are you technically tilling yeah but your amount of disturbance is going to be very 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 small relative um, and if you want it to you know for some cover crops using a seed drill you can see much much better results uh, around germination than just doing a broadcast so you know in my mind and this is my personal opinion. I think seed drills still fall within the no-till practices, to be honest with you. Letter of the law, man, probably not. It's still tilling to some extent, but the amount of disturbances is, is actually pretty, pretty small. Uh, what do you guys tell us think about uh, seed drills? Yeah, we have, um, well, for the orchard, we have a, the rows, as we said, are 10 feet apart. We have a seed drill that's eight feet apart, uh, eight feet wide, sorry. Um, and it, it is uh, what they class as an overseeder. Uh, came out of Europe, um, and it basically it, it cuts a furrow, as you said. Um, these uh, this specific seed uh, is uh, three inches apart, so we get a lot of seed in a in a relatively small spread, um, and then it closes up behind. But we've had really good uh, germination rates with that specific seed. Uh, it's very very good at what it does, um, and we did broadcast seed here when we first came before we had that seed, uh, and the germination rates were nowhere near as good as what we get now. It's all about soil contact, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think also, you know, benefits of a seed drill too, is that you also uh, can modify your seed drills or some seed drills come with this where you can actually spray an extract as the seed falls, just before it falls into the furrow, you can actually spray an extract to coat those seeds or even a compost tea whereas it just gets into the soil and then covers back up. And so it's another good opportunity to be able to impart, impart biology where a lot of times when you're broadcasting, if you try to wet the seeds, 
the broadcasters don't work very well. You know, it's 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 a tough stick. Tough, it's, yeah, it's sticky. <laughs> you could try to to soak the seeds and then dry the seeds and then you know get some dormant biology kind of existing on the seed coat, uh, but it's it's tough um, to do on the broadcast. Uh, anything else, Joe? Did you have a? No, I was just going to ask the method of spreading the seeds. Was it using a no-till seed drill or was it just broadcasting? Because you'll have higher germination rates when you're actually covering the seed with the soil versus just having it on the surface of the soil. Right. And, you know, and uh, myself and some of my colleagues were trying some different techniques. And one of the techniques is potentially just have like a hydro seeder where you can make like a compost slurry. So a slurry that's going to be wet and then the seeds get incorporated in the slurry and then you broadcast that slurry out there. So now the seeds have, have definitely good contact with biology. There's some organic matter um, and we're seeing some, you know, positive indications in that sense as well. So hydro seeding might be a way to, to do a broadcast approach, um, but I still think we need to take some more time to, to understand that. Yeah, it's kind of like the um, the front end uh, would be broadcasting out in that slurry, but the back end um, is a snowblower blowing the compost out on top of everything. So there's a good layer. So all of these things, and then depending on what kind of seed you're growing. So exactly. Okay. Uh, anything else, uh, panelists? All right. Let's move on to the next question here. Uh, this question is from Bruno, and uh, the question is, what would be the difference of building the pile at the site at the tree rows? Would that increase the microbiology faster in local instead of building somewhere else and then bringing it to the orchard? Well, so yeah, the there's yeah, kind of two two steps there. Um, if you're how far away um, is your pile being made? You know, and and we tend to. Um, limit and want to have people think about if they're more than 150 miles away um you could have some significant um, climatic changes and you may or may not have all of the microorganisms that you want if you're moving that far away so you've got to think a little bit about what are the organisms in here and we know that uh, many of those organisms that are used to a certain set of um, environmental effects, um, you know, temperature and, and when it when is it hot, when is it cold, does that meet? I love a lot of the um, senior, the grasses in the Great Plains of the United States. The, um, the seed had to go out while it was still cold enough. It had to have a, a rainfall event at a certain number of days after it was the seed falls to the ground um, and then if it, it's got to dry down and another seven to ten days after that you have had to have another rainfall event and then you would have real good yields um, well how often is that going to happen um, in the real world uh, so and if you're till if you're tilling if you're disturbing that system in any way you destroy the chain so we want to have things made locally, as locally as you can. So why not have your windrow right next to the field that that compost is going to go on? Well, then you've got, you're driving around the, the um, farm and is that really a benefit? Um, are we going to account for the money that takes um, with the, with with the uh, having your um, compost right there next to the field. Yeah, it really speaks to efficiency, right, Elaine? I mean, what are you going to do with that compost? If you're going to be using it right there in the field, the closest spot to it may be the most efficient spot to be able to, to develop it. But if you were going to brew it and everything else, maybe it's going to be better to have it next to where your brewers are at and and where you're going to use it. And also I find when you're making compost, you know, especially thermophilic compost, there is an intense period of management in the beginning where you're managing temperature, moisture, and you turn it. Um, if you have it 
way 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 <laughs> you know and it's like okay it's getting cold outside it's already six o'clock at night am i going to drive out to that location and take my temperatures uh you know so think about that too where's the most efficient spot for you to be able to make the compost so you're going to pay attention to it and nurture it the way it needs to be nurtured yeah okay. i just also want to add uh convenience wise as well so we really want to make sure that the compost organisms are well protected from the environment, from elements, I mean, from wind, from UV. So the fields are very open. Um, having them out in the fields, would it, it would be a lot harder to manage. There's also accessibility to water. Um, and also one of the things that Ian had uh, configured on his farm is he wanted to have a microbial station essentially all in one place where everything is done all in one place. So he has some organize that organization aspect in his farm um, where accessibility is really the, the, the one of the main focus. Um, Ian, is there anything you want to add as far as building your compost? Also the trees, right? We had, you have forested areas where you're yeah. building your compost piles and really yeah. uh, versus having it out in the orchard where there's not much life there at, before. Whereas if you were to build it in the forested areas, you might actually be, be inviting a diverse set of organisms from the forested areas and then inoculating the fields with those organisms. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, like the the compost making process is uh, quite labor intensive. I, I think to make a batch of compost um, that you can then use to make uh, teas or whatever else you want to do with that material, um, I think it's probably an eight to 10 hour process, I would say, from start to finish to actually make that compost, get that compost through the three cycles that we need to a point where we can then uh, use it for brewing tea. And to invest that amount of time, you really need to to be having all the material that you need for that compost in, in one place. And if you're going to be making any volume of compost like we are now, like we make multiple batches a year now, um, the actual raw material that you need to make that compost, it can be quite large in volume um, and you need to keep it in an environment where it's not degrading before you use it. Um, and then the area, as you say, that we have chosen to make our compost in, like we have a deck there, it makes it kind of easier to mix rather than just down on the dirt. Um, and then we've kind of tucked it in the forest a bit again, as you said. So we don't have those external factors that you have no control over. You, you're able, you're able to control those external factors a little better. Like you're not out in the middle of a field where it's windy and the wind's blowing through your cages and it's pulling the temperature away from your compost. Like it needs to be somewhat sheltered. It needs to be not in an area where if you get a sudden thunderstorm that the whole pile is going to get soaked or your raw materials are going to get soaked through too. Um, there's some planning, I think, to, to doing this process well. But the... To, what you get out of that planning is is exceptionally good compost that you can then use to to make your inoculants and then put out on your field. Like we we we've shown that from where we started making our first compost pile to the level of compost that we're producing now is like it's worlds apart. And and I, I would say ninety five percent of that is control of the materials and the environment that you're making your compost in. I think it's hard, isn't it, when you, you have a lot of these questions, is it best to do it this way or that way? It almost takes you back to your permacultural principles to observe and find out what's going on on your land because what's best for us might not be best for you. So, yeah, just observe and understand what you have in your own area to answer these questions sometimes. And we well, get people I, oh, who will come in and... Um, they want to know exactly what they have to do to make good compost. And it's like, we're, we're going to hand you a little booklet. You now, here you go. Here's the little booklet. Just read it through, do exactly what it says, and you, it'll be wonderful. And, you know, you've got a, you know, a charlatan there. If you, you know, trying to convince you of something, you really, in the first year or two, maybe even to the third year, you want to be trying different size um, composting mechanisms or, you know, anything you can dream up of that might make a more diverse set of microorganisms in that compost. After three years, you probably have really good inocula 
hanging out all throughout all of your starting materials throughout the area where your windrows are going to go down and you don't have to worry so much at that point but the development of that manageable uh, diversity maximized as as far as you can do it it takes a little time i actually have a question for kathy and ian so when you went first got the property and you to start your composting did you you know, pick the right spot or did you end up moving it, tweaking it as you went along until you kind of found out, okay, this is really where I need to make my compost? Yeah, we're in a different spot now than we were originally. Yeah, we're still in the forest. We, <laughs> we, we still stuck with the forest program, but we're in a different spot. It's a lot more sheltered where it, where it is now. And um, we had real issues with uh, with wind. We're kind of somewhat on the top of a hill where we had it originally. And the and the actual air movement was sucking the moisture out of the piles, and it was uh, sucking the heat out of the piles too. Mm-hmm. So now what? Now we're in a much more sheltered location, um, and and yeah, we're able to keep the heat in those piles way easier where they are now. It's easier to manage. The process is way easier to manage now. Sure, and, and that speaks exactly what you guys were talking about. What Lane was talking about, which was you, you got to observe. You just kind of you know, pay attention to the conditions that are in that area. When I had my homestead in you know Northern California, I think I, I went through four different locations until I finally figured out, okay, this is where I'm going to make my compost. Um, and then once I had that spot set up, it was great. I felt like I was, you know, fully set up, very efficient and everything else. So, you know, don't, the message to everybody else out there is don't worry about, you know, if you choose the wrong spot to start with, you learn from it and then figure it out and move to the next spot. And then you may have to move multiple uh, locations until you really kind of find the right area to be able to do that work. All right, great. So let's move on to another question here. All right, next question, panelists. This one's from Daniel, which is, Converting a conventional farm to agroecological one, how many initial years should the farmer expect to lose profitability if he loses until he recovers? This is a question I get a lot from clients that I have, but uh, panelists, I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. If they follow the rules and really do make a good, highly diverse um, set of microorganisms in that compost, I have never seen anybody lose profitability. Um, sometimes they haven't increased the per- percentage of growth that would be possible if um, you really got the right organisms in that compost. But I, I've never seen somebody go belly up if they were following directions. I've had a couple of clients where they just could not listen. Um, And when I tell them they're going to have to do something about the high salt level in the water coming out of that well, and they don't pay any attention to me, it's goodbye. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I I always find it it is a challenge with a lot of conventional farmers, especially multi-generational. They've been doing this forever and ever and ever this way. It's a mindset shift that has to happen. But really, I think, you know, what our role is is to help people understand that there's a transition process. How can we actually make this transition work for you so you can still maintain profitability as we're getting the soil biology you know, inoculated, established, and start taking on the role that they used to provide when they did fertilization, pest management, all the other kind of things? Um, so, yeah, you, you can definitely help people through transition and still maintain profitability. I think that's a misconception that's out there, which is if I'm going to switch from agrochemical to farming with biology, I have to take a huge financial hit to be able to do that. And I think that's just an untrue statement. You have to be wise about it. um, And you have to understand what the transition process is so that you can make the transition effective. Um, But once you go through that process, then again, you know, like Elaine said, the clients have to be able to, 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 pay attention to that. <laughs> you could give recommendations and they're like, eh, I want to do that. Well, there's consequences to that sometimes um, by not following some of those very <laughs> guidelines that we try to set in place. So Joe? I think you've, oh, sorry. You've, Go ahead. you've probably gotten a lot of help from Joe. Um, there's your guiding light, the person who could <laughs> give you the information. So it works. Yeah, I want to know uh, Kathy and Ian's uh, opinion on that. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> we haven't come necessarily from the other side. We were always sort of permaculture 
minded. So um, I don't know if our personal experience is good, but I'm just thinking about people, like you say, people have to be all in, don't they, to make this work. Um, and if they're not, if they're sitting on the fence, we're seeing it with some friends at the moment who are doing a little bit of this and still a bit of their own ways and stuff. And I think it's reasonable for them to expect to see maybe a loss in yield, maybe not just strong success in the first few years until they get totally on board. What do you think? I think it can be the case more often than not, um, certainly with uh, uh, perennial crops more than annuals, that what you're taking over are the plants that you have at the time when you start a transition. Um, people forget that they're probably sick already, um, especially if they've been spraying all sorts of chemicals for a multitude of, of different things, which is pretty much the norm these days. I think that those plants are are sick to begin with. And, and just like it takes us time to actually heal before we see real benefits and we feel better, I think it takes time for those plants to get over the worst that they're, they're feeling before the type of biology that we're applying starts to take hold and the plant actually feels the actual effects of what we're doing. Um, certainly, um my experience or the li very little experience I have with, with vineyards. Um, I see a lot of spraying, a lot of very sick plants all of the time, but to try and get people off that program and onto a biological program can be quite hard because they don't want to see that drop in yield, but they don't really realize that sooner or later that drop in yield is coming anyway because the plant is getting sicker and sicker and sicker every year and the problems that they have get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I guess it's finding that sweet spot where it's like, okay, now's the time to change. Now we have to change. Otherwise they're, they're going to lose yield anyway. But, but I think also, and, yeah, yeah, I think also we're so focused on yield. We're so focused on yield where we should be focused on the nutritional value of what we're producing, because you might get a hundred tons of a product with very, very poor nutrition, or you get 50 tons of product where the nutrition's off the scale. Like what should we be producing? The latter of the two, I would say. Sure. And I think, I think consumers are getting to that spot where, understanding nutritional density and the nut nutritional quality of your food that you're consuming is becoming more paramount versus just the cost of the food that you're eating. Right. Um, and, and I think there'll be tools in the future that are going to come out in the market. They're going to help those consumers understand what the nutritional content is of the fruits and veggies that are being produced. That would yeah, really, I think help drive the market more. Yeah. I remember a, a, a story I'll tell you about our old farm in Langley. So we had an open day at the farm on a Saturday morning. We had this uh, older guy come, come into the greenhouse. I was pruning tomatoes at the time. And uh, he said, Oh, and he was admiring what we had going on. And I said, well, just take one. And he said, Oh, really? I said, yep. There's like, there's nothing on here that you can't eat. So anyway, he takes this tomato and bites into it. The tomato juice is running down his beard. And he's like, he's just blown away by the flavor. And he's like, how come the tomato in the store doesn't taste like this? And <laughs> that, really that, that's tomato. how you get people, right? That's right. that's how you get people hooked on, on good quality food, I think. I we used to run a farm camp and the same thing with the kids. They didn't yeah. know what tomatoes were meant to taste like. <laughs> and by the end, we couldn't get them to try them at first, you know, and they'd pick them and where can I wash it? Oh, don't wash it. Just put it in your mouth. Yeah, okay. And so then by the end of the week, our greenhouse was like picked clean. It cost us a fortune. Now. <laughs> <laughs> like tomatoes are it. Uh, but healthy kids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, healthy kids. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, you know what? I think this was a great question to go ahead and end on. Um, I just have a little bit of housekeeping to finish this up here. Um, so let me just pull this back up. And uh, what I wanted to mention is that we do have two more webinars, like I mentioned in the beginning uh, of this webinar, that we're going to go through. So 11 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, February 15th, which is going to be Symbiotic Impact of Agroecology and the Soil Food Web. And then we have another webinar at 11 a.m. Pacific on Wednesday, February 28th, which is Cultivating Living Soils 
why soil matters, and how to further your education in soil regeneration. So please, uh, you know, look for that, and hopefully you can attend those webinars. And if you can't, we always have the replays, so you can watch them at your leisure. All right, and with that, I'd like to give some big thanks. You know, behind the scenes, there are quite a few people at the Sofa Web School that do a lot of hard work to put these webinars on. So I really like to thank our support staff that's out there. Um, I'd also like to thank you as attendees. You know, without your interest and and your passion, you know, for the things that we're trying to share, uh, these wouldn't happen. So thank you very much for taking the time and actually attending these webinars. And lastly, I'd like to be able to thank our panelists. So Kathy and Ian and Joe, thank you so, so much for you know, providing that story. Really great data, really, really good, transparent, open, honest discussion around your farm. I really like that. And, and obviously, Dr. Lane Ingham, uh, the work that you do and the, the knowledge that you've shared and the inspiration that you give uh, has been fantastic in this community. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank everybody. Yeah, well, Thanks we need to thank you. Um, the host, <laughs> yeah, you always do a great job. It's amazing. You're just so great at it. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. With that, I think we're going to call this a wrap and we'll hope to see you guys at webinar three. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Don't forget to click that like button, subscribe to our channel and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.